All right, welcome to level three. This is conflict resolution. Y'all got any conflict in your life? <laughs> We're going to talk conflict. So before we jump into that, let's do what we've done the last several weeks, and we'll start off by asking you, is there any, any, uh, anything we need to hit from uh, communication last week, uh, anger the week before that, or adultery the week before that? Y'all got those three topics down? Got all the verses memorized? Understand how to gain understanding and ask questions about them and give biblical hope and extract principles from God's Word on each of those topics and then be able to provide some practical uh, guidance for homework so we can drive change down to the behavioral level. You feel like you can do it? <laughs> Y'all look very reserved. <laughs> You're like, oh, well. <laughs> will he call on me if I say you can do it? Okay, turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 12. I don't have a handout for you tonight because there's not one that I've done. There's lots of stuff out there, but um, most of it's not very good. Somebody tell me what conflict is. What is conflict? Two people disagree with each other. Okay. Disagreement? What else would you say conflict is? Strife. Um, it's a struggle, isn't it? Of between opinions and people and ideas and all kinds of things. Let me give you the uh, the official definition, but all of y'all are you're, you're all around it. It says Conflicts or disagreements, struggles, or battles over opposing issues or principles. Let me give it to you again. Conflicts are disagreements, struggles, or battles over opposing issues or principles. Uh, a reference that you can jot down for that is Colossians 2.1, which says, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and those in Laodicea. It's the, that word struggling uh, that Paul... Uh, wrote to the church at Colossae about the church at Colossae and the church at Laodicea. Uh, what's the difference between resolution and reconciliation? Resolution and reconciliation. What do you think the difference is? Uh, see, reconciliation is, is harmony afterwards, right? Okay. So resolution, not necessarily sometimes, is all that I mean, you come to a, some, some kind of an agreement, but it, it's not necessarily that you're one with the same ideas. Yeah, that's that, that's that's all around. Anybody else have any idea? Terry's about got it nailed. If if you have a resolution, that's finding an answer. Okay. So if you find an answer, that's a resolution. A reconciliation deals with Harmony of relationships. So it brings with bringing relationships into one. So is it possible, now think about this before you answer it, is it possible to have a situation whereby a resolution is achieved, but not reconciliation? Yes. You think? Yes. It's possible to find an answer to a problem. Right? And it may be uh, difficult, impossible, or even inappropriate to reconcile. Okay, let me give you an example. Um, I had uh, one of the first uh, counselees in, in this building. That they followed me uh, location wise from uh, the uh, other building when we relocated here, uh, it was an individual that had been involved in a cult. And one of the things that we wanted to do with that individual 
is just like someone who's recovering from addiction, write these three things down. You need, if, you, if it's an addiction situation or if it's some situation where somebody is involved in some kind of harmful group or unhealthy group. They need to be removed or they need to have radical change in their people, places, and things. People, places, and things. So you have to find a way to get them away from their people or their friends, their associations. Because if you've got someone that's in addiction or someone that's using, someone that's dabbling in drugs or alcohol or whatever, um, the, the associations that they have, the friendships that they have are key. So you better find a way to demolish them or to break those ties. Because if they, if they remain friends or close to this group that, that may be harmful, whether it's an addiction type group or, or a cultic type group, if they remain friends with them, chances are they're not going to have victory over uh, the situation. Uh, places, the, um, we're, we're creatures of habit. And so, you know, the way that the, the route that we take to work or the route that we take to church, the route that we take to a friend's house, uh, all of them can be problematic. Um, driving by so-and-so's house, somebody that you grew up with or somebody you used to hang out with, um, all those things can be terrible. You know, and, and, and we've had situations with people going through addiction where they'd have to drive five or six miles out of the way so it didn't get them in trouble. And I mean, it's it's ridiculous, but we've done we've done GPS trackers to ensure people's uh, path. Uh, we've done uh, uh, accountability as far as people uh, checking in. We've had uh, camera shots done um, uh, on them arriving at a at a person's house. I mean, whatever it takes to ensure that this individual is is breaking that mold, because it, if they don't break it, if they don't get away, it could kill them. I mean, you're you're talking about life and death here. These, these are serious things that you're dealing with. So you have to find some way to get away from people and places. The third one is the things in their life. Uh, there are all different kinds of things that can lead people into bad areas. Um, if, if someone's using, you want to keep them away from money. And if it's a male, you want to keep, sorry ladies, but you keep them away from females and you keep them away from a car. Okay, so if you've got anybody that's using any type of addict, the worst thing in the world for them, you know, you may think, man, let's get you back on your feet. We need to get you on your feet. Let's get you a job. Now we got you a job. You got some money coming in. Let's get you a car. Let's get you some independence. Uh, those are disastrous in many cases. So you don't want to give them money. Them having money burned in their pocket, um, you, you have no idea how many times. Well, you you're probably the only one in the room that has been through that. But you have no idea how many times you, you're exposed to people who you're working with and they're, they're, they're getting better, things are on track, and then BAM, they're right back into it. Uh, and you think, what happened? You know, what, what was the deal? You know, and, and you know when, when they come clean with you and they sit there with their head, head hanging down because they're embarrassed because they've gone through the ringer again for the 15th time, and they tell you, well, it was, I had 40 bucks. 40 bucks did it? $40 did you in. I mean, just crazy. Uh, vehicle, giving them mobility, a way, a way to get around. Um, you should, uh, in, in the counseling setting, restrict mobility to an addict. You have to have high accountability and low mobility, right? So you need to, you need to know where they are and how they're moving about. Relationships are disastrous because we, uh, if someone is in active addiction, which uh, I believe is a behavioral pattern, not a disease. Let me just kind of throw that out there. I believe it's a behavioral pattern. I do not believe alcoholism is a disease. Now, I believe there are some some components that look like that. So, I mean, we can talk about that when we get on alcohol. Let's don't drive down that path too far today. But, but there, I, I believe it's behavioral patterns that they're in that, that can be broken. In other words, I would never say for a believer, I would never stand up and say, "Hey, my name is Scott." I'm an alcoholic. And everybody says, hello, Scott. How you doing, Scott? And then for me to say, to, to go into this uh, uh, diatribe of sharing my story, and me to share how I've been victorious over my alcoholism, or victorious over my disease, I have to fight it every day, I have to get up every day, and, you know, and uh, 
I, I go through the serenity prayer every day. I go to meetings, you know, three days a week. You know, and I do all these things, but I'm I'm still an addict. And and, and so somebody asked me, well, you're you're still an addict, Scott? Yes, because alcoholism is forever. This is what they're taught now. So you, that somebody would ask me, well, when when did you last use, Scott? When was your last drink? And I say, it's been 19 years. You say 19 years, Scott, and you're still an addict. See, from, from a, a, a Christian perspective, from a biblical perspective, 2 Corinthians 5.17, 2 Corinthians 5.21, both indicate you're made a new creation. So, I mean, if, if, if Alcoholics Anonymous is true, and what they're saying is true, and there's never true transformation on the inside of me, or I can never be transformed, then I would say, well, I'm, I'm a murderer. When's the last time you killed somebody? Well, the Bible says if you have an angry thought, it's the same as murder. And I, you know, I had an angry thought, you know, several years ago, just about someone I couldn't stand them. So I'm, I'm a murderer. You know, what I mean? that that logic would be so crazy. You'd say, Scott, that's not true. You know, God's given you the victory over that. God has, God has cleansed you. God has forgiven you. You have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, you have power. Greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world. Scott, you have victory. Then I would say, well, how do you have victory if you know, I've been clean from alcohol for 19 years, but I still have to stand up and confess that I'm an alcoholic. You know, I'd like to be able to stand up and tell the truth, which is, I have been set free by the power of God. And God is bigger than alcoholism. God is bigger than, than meth. God's bigger than, than, than being a prescription drug addict. God's bigger than these things. God's bigger than this cult. This, the, the case that I was telling you about, this, this gentleman that came, we had to put in place all kinds of things for them. We had to monitor where he was. Uh, we had to monitor his, his income. And as the counselor, I was in charge of that. So you're going to be responsible for lots of things. You have to start thinking, what would it take holistically to, to handle this kind of situation? What would I do for this? And um, when it comes to and, and somebody that's an addict, you have to deal with all elements of their life. If you, if you just deal with one component of their life, you're going to miss it. Like, for instance, I've got, I've got someone that's in counseling right now, uh, just completed session two, that um, is in active addiction. Okay? The last time I counseled with this individual, I, I made the statement, uh, you're still using. You know, our agreement was that you would clean out the house, and that you would give me some kind of confidence that you have done so, and that you would not lie to me. Those are the, the guidelines for counseling. So if you're going to, to lie or mislead me, then um, I'm not going to talk to you because I'm not going to be part of the deception. I'm not going to be fueled to your fire. If you want to burn up, you're going to burn up all on your own, not my own. And the individual said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. That's what you told me. You haven't been using alcohol. Well, I have And I said, well, I smell it on you. Right now, I smell it. And the individual denied it up and down, you know, but the, the, the point is, I know that there's a biological level of addiction, right? There's a biological connection. In other words, if you use a drug for a certain period of time, the, the very chemicals in your body will begin to, to, to develop in such a way where they look for that. They'll begin to, to uh, attach to it, to, to draw it in. And so that's why, you know, you have to go through places like the Phoenix Center or other places to detox because if, if you've got an, an abnormally high uh, uh, um, morphine addiction, you've been on, you know, you, you, had, you were in a car wreck, and because of a car wreck, they prescribed you some, some uh, morphine for your back, and that, that was the beginning of the end for you, and you, you started abusing morphine. And so if you're using a high level of morphine and, and you go to see a, a biblical counselor, if they come to see you and you say, stop taking that stuff, and they listen, it's one of the frightening things about being a counselor, sometimes the counselees listen. Um, if they listen to you and they just stop at cold turkey, there could be detrimental health side effects. We're not doctors, so you don't, you don't get in that realm, right? And so what... You know, you, you sometimes have to do is you have to work with some kind of uh, third party or some other institution to get them to reduce or slowly come off that, that type of uh, medication. So there's a biological or a chemical dependency. But secondly, 
there's a psychological dependency. You know, if I, you know, I've got um, someone that I had in counseling that, that bailed on me after the, the second or third session. I don't remember which, but um, it was a pretty uh, aggressive uh, counselee. He was kind of mad at the world. Um, you may, you may know who I'm talking about. Um, I don't know, remember if you were in there. Somebody was in there as a student on this. I don't remember which or not. But anyway, they they got irritated in the the, the second or third week of counseling. And I had asked them to provide some kind of verification that uh, that they they cleaned the alcohol out of the house, no more alcohol in, in their uh, work truck, you know that it was gone because an alcoholic will keep alcohol everywhere, or drunks. I mean, they'll they'll be you'd, you'd be amazed on the places you find it, right? So um, when I pressed this individual for that a little bit and asked him for verification, he said, "Well, you know, you're you're going to have to take my word for it." I said, "Well, in all um, with all due respect." Um, that's not how this works. We we verify things, you know, and, and uh, I know how the the heart of people works. You know, uh, Jeremiah seventeen nine. You know, you got a wicked heart, so we we verify things. And so when I tried to verify that with a family member, uh, it blew him out of counseling. He went, mm -mm. And, uh, and and come to find out, it was a deception. It was a grand scheme. He was saying one thing but doing another, but he didn't get far, and I, and I wasn't used as a tool very long, you know, because I, we knew that something was up, that he, that he wouldn't come clean. So, as a counselor, you have to address all those things. You're responsible for that. So when you take on a counselee, uh, before you say yes, uh, you know what you're saying yes to, you know, because their 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 agreement, you, you inform consent them, right? So when you consent them, they're agreeing. To, to, to sign waivers, they're agreeing to, to sign medical information releases, they're agreeing to sign HIPAA forms that can be given to their, their medical doctor or their specialist or whomever. They're agreeing to those things and they're agreeing to adhere to your counsel. They're agreeing to be honest and tell you the truth. They're agreeing to, to, to meet with you once a week for the next six to eight weeks on average. That's their agreements that they're making. The agreement you're making is that you have uh, a reasonable expectation and a capacity uh, to use God's Word uh, through prayerful dependence upon the Holy Spirit to bring about transformation. So I mean, so it's a pretty tall order. So if you've got somebody, if you've got somebody that's been an alcoholic for 25 years, you know, you're not the first person trying to overcome that in their life. You may be the hundredth. Yes, sir. Do you, um, since you I almost said you guys, but um, you have to be a Christian to come to biblical counseling. What if they're not saved? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, no, you don't. Um, for us, uh, well, somebody else answered that. For Vicky, well, what would you do? How do you answer her question? What would you say if, uh, first of all, can a non-believer come? And what, how, what, what is your approach? I'd say yes. Can't really give them thorough biblical counsel until they know the truth, know, 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 know the Holy Spirit lives in them, because they, they can't understand what we're trying to teach them without that, can they? I mean, um, they're allowed, they can come, but you have to, right from the very beginning, you have to make sure they understand what kind of counseling it is. That the, what they're going to hear is strictly Bible. And um, you would have you would share the gospel with them immediately because the only way to change and change successfully is through biblical standard of living. And if they don't, okay. Two good thoughts so far. Anybody else have an answer for her? I would say that you definitely have to pre counsel, um, which is giving them. The the plan of salvation, giving them biblical hope. Um, but Scott was right in the fact that they will not be able to understand that. Um, but our resources are scripture and the Holy Spirit and prayer. And without the Holy Spirit, they won't be able to change on their own. They have to, they have to be pre counseled. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they all gave excellent uh, responses. So uh, the biblical counseling, the nuthetic approach. Um, is 
if somebody desires help, we help. And, you know, Allison and I were talking earlier, I don't help somebody who doesn't desire help. I know that may sound like a no-brainer, but I've had people like, you know, uh, David calls me and says, Scott, my son-in-law or my brother-in-law, man, he's a real piece of work. I cannot do anything with this guy. You know, I've tried to talk to him until I'm blue in the face, but because we're so close, he doesn't listen to me. I need you to come talk to him. You know, I would say respectfully, no. <laughs> you know, because they, if somebody does not want to talk to me, now I used to be in a situation where I worked for the state or for the county, and so as a counselor and as uh, a, uh, a liaison between the, uh, the church world and the county, they had to come see me. They didn't have a choice. It would be court, court ordered. But now, God has blessed me with the privilege of working with uh, a spiritual army, a group of believers. You know, and so I'm principally responsible for my own church. That's what I'm responsible for. So that's where my, my focus lies. And, uh, and I counsel those who want to be counseled. So if they want to come see me, then I'm, I'm open. And I always tell people, I told an individual earlier today, I had a tough counseling. A rough day but I told an individual earlier today you stay with me and I'll stay with you I'm not giving up you know because they've been through just a traumatic event you know and I said I'm not giving up you know if you you, you don't give up on me I won't give up on you let's we'll, we'll press on and I'm a pretty good person to have on your team because I'm committed I'm loyal um, I love the Lord I love people I'm committed to Scripture God's spirit lives inside of me. So, you know, and, and you all can say the exact same thing I just said, right? Because you all have the spirit as well. So that's what we would do. But their their capacity, hupomini, their capacity for change is limited. They can do some good things. Um, I, if someone is a non-believer, I would immediately start. If, if they came to me, if their presentation issue uh, was anger, <clears throat> I'd immediately start working on the anger because that's their interest level. That's the hook for them. So they would want to see some kind of relief to the anger. So I've got things that we can do that would bring immediate relief to somebody who has problems with anger. Just some simple techniques you can do that we've used for the last 20 years that are effective with anger. However, my end goal would not be giving them a peaceful, controlled spirit. My end goal would be Christ's likeness. That's always our aim in biblical counseling, right? And so we cannot get them to Christ's likeness without God's Spirit quickening them, moving, moving in their life, and bringing about a, a real transformation as they willingly humble themselves and cry out for forgiveness and, and seek the, the deep cleansing from the Father and uh, say, adopt me into your family, make me your child. You know, that's, that's what we're after. So the answer to your question is yes, we would pre-counsel. I would, I would address their presentation issue because that's what brought them in. I'd do everything I could to address that. But very early on, uh, like one of y'all said, very early on I'd be talking about the gospel. I may not call it the gospel, um, but I would be, I'd be talking that language very early on. If it's someone who's, you know, lots of people, especially people coming out of addiction, are angry at God. So, um, I mean, they say they are. I'm not sure how much that, that's really true. But anyway, I, would, I, may, I may call it the plan of hope, uh, the plan of transformation, you know, some, something like that. But in, in, in the end, I would let them know Ordo Salutes or what, you know, that, that very detailed plan that I walk people through so they understand the order of salvation and what happens, and they understand it's a spiritual divine event, not a humanistic event. So I can't lay timetables on it. That's a God work. We can do the best we can to try to wrap our human heads, our finite minds around it, but it's a high concept, y'all. So in other words, if you get someone that says, I want, to, want you to counsel me, you're going to do pre-counseling, you're going to talk with them before you decide to take it on or not. No, I'm going to take them on. If they want me, I want them. To them, they won't know the difference. Right. Right. And if they want, if they're open to it and they're seeking help, I believe in the sovereignty of God. So, okay, let me tell you how I view it. Just like your question that you just asked. 
like your presence here tonight. I view that as, an, as a, a, a sovereign act of a powerful God. And I believe there's a purpose behind these things. So if that person shows up and, have, and has a desire, um, you know, James chapter 1 says, all good gifts come from above, from the Father of lights, and then there's no variableness or shadow of turn, right? So I believe that, is that verse 17 maybe? Or James 1, something in the teens. But I believe that's a desire that came from the Lord. And so whether that person is a believer yet or not, uh, I would, um, you know, do whatever I could to help. I have, I have a overwhelming desire to help. I want people to be victorious. I want um, spiritual warriors to be created. And I've never been satisfied with the status quo, whole hum, go to church for a little bit, throw some money in the plate, go about your business till next week. It's never satisfied me. Even before I was active in the ministry, it did not satisfy me. I wanted to be a warrior. There's something in, inside of me that wants to fight. And I'm not talking about aggressive toward an individual. I'm talking about fight for the kingdom. Fight for 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 lost lost people. Uh, I have I've had three sisters that have died. Um, uh, just tragic stuff. I don't ever talk about it because I don't talk about my story because this this whole time it's not about me. It's about you and the Lord. Um, but one of the problems um, that was a constant that's been a theme through our family. My mother has been through the ringer. That woman has been through more things than just about anybody I know. And she's tough as nails. But um, one of the constant themes was there wasn't a spiritual warrior around them. There wasn't anybody to stand and fight. And um, so I've had this compelling desire to fight. You know, I told somebody earlier today, um, if you go back into the, I'm, I'm threatening to, to hurt myself mode again, I'm going to cut you loose if I think it's credible. And I think if, it, if I think it's a cry for help, then I'll try to give you the help. But I, if I think it's cred credible and you've gone into fatalism, I'm cutting you loose because I'm not going through that again. You know, I'll just call the, I'll, I'll call the sheriff's department. They don't like doing this, but they will take you to the emergency room. You'll be at, you know, at, at Greenville Memorial for six hours. It'll be a wasted trip. They'll end up either taking you home or they'll, you know, take you to Marshall Pickens. You'll spend three days there and then you'll be right back in the same spot again. It'll be a hassle, a lot, a lot of stuff humanistic philosophy and junk that most of those people tell you anyway. So, you know, don't do it. So my, my whole point is I want to fight for people. And there is nobody that can fight like the people in this room. And, and you guys having a the desire, there's no one that can do that. Do you realize how few pastors are confident enough to say, what do you want to talk about tonight? You, you choose the theme. We'll go to God's Word. You choose the theme and we'll talk about it. Everybody wants to be prepared to have their presentation together, to have all their notes in alignment. But you know, if, if, if Scripture is in my heart, I don't need all my notes together. And, you know, as, as, a, as a warrior for God's kingdom, you don't have to have that either. If you have a desire and you study, study to show thyself a pretty good workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, right? If that's you and you study, and God's Word begins to take root in your life, Jesus says, I will surely tell you all things through the power of the Holy Spirit. So when the Comforter comes, the, the promise of the Comforter is to tell you all things, for you to remember these things, for, for knowledge to expand. What I told you several weeks ago, I don't know if you were here that night, maybe, but I, I, I shared several weeks ago about the power of the Holy Spirit and about how God can do things through you that you've never learned before. Y'all Were you all here? Y'all you remember that? And, you know, I, I said we could go around the room right now. And um, the, the Holy Spirit is so powerful that he could move and you could talk about a, a topic, a subject, or a theme that you had not prepared for, that you had not studied. The Holy Spirit has that kind of power. He's God. He can do anything, right? And so it, I wanted to be associated with a group of people who were warriors, that wanted to fight for people. You know, and in my view, I've never seen anybody do that like in counseling. When they say, well, we love the Lord, and we love you, we don't claim to have all the answers, but we know God does, and so we're going to go to the Word. And if you'll commit to adhere to do what the Word says, I'm going to commit to, to, to stand on the Word and to stand on truth, and we're going to watch God get the victory. So what I mean, with that, that's that warrior mentality, and I think you can have that... Um, 
and you don't, that person doesn't need to be a believer to come into that environment. But I'm all the time thinking in that mentality. But I'm, I'm a, uh, I'm a very passionate guy. I'm very, um, I'm, I'm very much a romantic when it comes to, you know, the the old ho the Hollywood movies, um, Knight's Tale. Have y'all seen the Knight's Tale? I think a Knight's Tale is one of the best movies I've ever seen. You know? Now I don't like any profanity. It's not because I'm too good for it. It's just because I don't like it. You know, I think it sounds just not like a believer should be talking. You know what I mean? But but I put up with that on some movies because the, the theme is just good. But like uh, 300, have y'all seen the movie 300? Mm -hmm. oh, just, I mean, uh, what's the, 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 uh, the movie where it's got, uh, what's his face? Um, the Catholic guy that made Passion of the Christ. Jim Caviezel. No. Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson, yeah. Um, that, what was that Mel, Mel Gibson movie? Where he, he, they were fighting in, in, in Scotland or Ireland. What was it? Braveheart. Yeah. See, that, that stuff is just me. You know, I think of that all the time. Now, I don't want to go cause harm to somebody. I don't mean that. But I mean, I think God needs warriors, or God uses warriors for the kingdom. And there aren't very many. You know, I have pastor friends of mine who will not counsel. And I don't get it. I, that does not make sense for me. You know, I have pastor friends of mine that don't know the people that go to the church. It's strange to me. It's like, what? Well, how, how do you? So you you, you got thirty five hundred? Well, yeah, we had two services. One for twenty five hundred. One about fifteen hundred. We run about five thousand. Why do you think that is? How, how do you do what? Why do you think that is? What do I think what is? They don't do it. I don't know, but I mean, I, I, and, and I have to be <coughs> careful because I. I have a policy that I do not speak ill of other pastors or, or churches. I don't. No, I'm not but, saying, it's, not, it's not just your friend, but that, that, you're right. You don't see counseling much. And it, I mean, church after church after church, you just don't. They send them somewhere else. They have, this, this friend of mine, they, oh, have, a, they have a counseling ministry. Uh, but there, uh, there are four or five of them. I don't know. I shouldn't speak. I don't know the details. But there, there are a handful of them. But they're uh, licensed marriage and family therapists, LMFTs. And it's just sad. You know, it's like, I, I, I want to say, what are you thinking? Is it because they've been hurt so much that they put the distance between them, themselves and the congregation? I, mean, I don't know. Are they just scared? I don't know. I really don't know what it is. But but for me, I have such a desire to do it. Like I have a desire to pour into you guys. I have a desire to give you everything I've got. That's now, a part lot of it, work too. Part part of it is, um, you know, uh, in I'm telling y'all stuff. I'm much more free tonight than I normally. Am. In November or October of 2010, I was given a death sentence. Okay, physically. And I was given 10 months to 10 years. So, um, and it's, you know, I made it way past 10 months, praise God. But um, that, it changed some things in me. You know, and I already had an intensity and passion for counseling. I've done that since 1996, okay? But it changed things because it, it became so much more uh, urgent. You know, I wanted to give people everything I had. Every note I've ever taken you know, I started giving all my Bibles away. You know, I, you know, I, I've given probably I don't know fifty or seventy-five Bibles away. I, I just started all the stuff, all my notes, because every one of my Bibles are, are ridiculously marked up. You know, I mean, all kinds of stuff. So I just started giving. Yeah, I know. So I started giving this stuff away because I wanted people to, to have that, and the, more than anything, I wanted my life to matter. I just wanted it to count for something, and I wanted people to have a passion for the word because you know we went to our, our very first Sunday that we met as a church was in uh, was October or I'm sorry April the 4th of 2004 okay first time we assembled together there were about 20 of us um, six members 14 people checking us out you know but we got in vehicles and we rode to a local church for an Easter service that was our very first service together and uh, I was just so disappointed with the, the shallowness, 
the lack of engagement, the lack of connection. You know, and I, I asked a friend of mine early on, how is it possible that you can grow as a believer in a church when you don't exercise your gift? How is it, number one, if you don't exercise your gift, how is that possible? I asked him, how is it possible if you're not known and you don't know people, how is it possible for you to grow? You know, and their, their opinion was, this individual was that, well, my growth is a very personal thing. You know, I'm, I'm responsible for it myself, which is true. But if you're not exercising your gift, if you're not, if you're good at lifting and pulling, and and she's good at dragging or being drugged, she needs a draggy or a dragger. <laughs> she needs somebody to lift and pull. You know what I'm saying? You, it, it, uh, arms, you know, um, uh, mouths love hands because hands can feed them a little bit, but they're not much good without an elbow. I mean, think if you didn't have an elbow, I mean, eating wouldn't be fun. Right? So you, you need all the parts of the body, and you have to be actively exercising that. That does not happen to any degree uh, as much as it does in biblical counseling. I'm telling you all, don't give this up. Uh, it's the most significant thing I've ever seen in my lifetime. Uh, you will witness God transforming people. You will witness God setting people free. And if you don't give up, and you stick to your guns, and you study, be a student of God's Word. Be a practitioner of God's Word. Do it. Let God's Word transform you. Let God's Word change you. You be the first counselee. And, uh, and let God move and let God work. So, don't give up. I don't know why I got on that. Just as a side note. Tangent. Knowing that our website, we do, it's going to be visited by Christians and non-Christians. We do have a section on that. When they go to the counseling page, it says, I'm not a Christian, and we're still inviting them. Come. That's right. Great, excellent point, thanks. So you will potentially get calls from non-Christians. Yep, so which is great. If on that, then they're already thinking from that direction. Yeah, they're looking for help. Yeah. And um, I'll just throw this out there before I get back on conflict, but j just think about this. The, ad, the typical Christian, if like the person Dennis just mentioned, they, they go to the website, they're looking for some help. Uh, they're, they're never going to go there when things are good, things are bad, right? You know, the, the, no one comes to talk to me unless the wheels are falling off. And the people that I know better, their situation is much, much worse for them to come talk to me because the pride issue is tough to get by, right? Everybody wants to put their best foot forward. But if somebody comes and they're at that point looking for help, they go to the website. Let's say they, 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 they call up one of their friends that they know attends church. And they say, what do I, what do I need to do? My life's a mess. I'm tired. I feel like I'm fighting against God. I, you know, I know God is real, but you know, I, I just I'm at my wit's end. I'm at the end of my rope. I don't know what to do. How many believers do you think would give them sound counsel on what to do? You know, I don't even know. I, I'm not even confident that they get sound counsel from people. You know, I had somebody that asked me today, Scott, would you be in support of a a, a Christian care group or Christian support group? For divorcees, or for singles, or for whatever, you know, there there are groups for everything out there in the sun. If you like watermelon, there's a group out there for you. Um, but I told this individual I don't support that, and she asked me why. What's the problem with it? I said because you just, if you're sitting in a circle with eight people in one of these care groups, okay, then you you just sub submitted yourself, subjected yourself, exposed yourself to seven counselors. Some of the counsel may be great counsel. Some of it may be terrible. You know, I was in a, uh, a life group setting one time, which this should not have happened, but I'll just be honest and tell you what happened. And in this life group setting, there, one of the individuals spoke up and said they were, they were hurting, you know, and they were, it was a very emotional time, and we were doing a study in First Peter, and this individual began to weep, and, and had gone through a painful separation, um, infidelity on, on the spouse's part. I mean, just a bad scene. And one of the people sitting right next to this person who's crying, right, in this group, said, you have to learn to love yourself. If you don't learn to love yourself, you'll never love anybody else. I, I, 
in that setting, I couldn't even correct it. But I thought, that's about as backwards of advice as you could give somebody. Now, it sounds good. You've got to learn to love yourself. You're going to learn to love somebody else. But what does that do? That turns all the focus from someone who's already focused on them, right? It goes, right? I'm going to have a, a, a me love fest. i got to take care of me. By God, nobody else is going to take care of me. I'm going to take care of me. You're right. You're right. I'm taking care of me. You know, and I'm thinking, no, no, no. That's exactly the wrong advice. That's why they need to come sit down and talk to you in prayerful consideration with an open Bible following the Holy Spirit. Not go to some group where you don't know what you're going to get. Now, I love groups, but don't use them for counseling. How do you fix that situation? If counseling's happening in the group? Yeah. Uh, with the group leaders, with the structure, the expectations of the group. Um, I've tried to drill that down with our people. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It still happens sometimes, but uh, you have to be very careful what you're saying. You know, people are so reckless with their words. They'll say about them, whatever. And they'll say that most of the time they're speaking from experience or what they're familiar with. That's what they say. Well, this is the way I was raised. You know, and they're, they're, what they're not saying behind the, the, the tone underneath that is, well, I think this is valid. This is how I was raised. You know, so my thought would be, does that matter? Or is what you're saying valid? Or... I mean, should we go to Scripture and really see what Scripture says? That's why I don't talk about my life and my experiences. i got all kinds of stuff I can tell you guys. But it's not important. <laughs> what's important is God's opinion. You know, what's God's view about this? Wait a minute. If you don't think that's important, how will people get close to you if they don't know you? I mean, I feel already close to you, and I don't know hardly anything, but you know what I mean. Well, because you're my pastor. I'm very, I'm very transparent. I don't hide things. Um... But uh, there, there, there are people that get close to me, um, closer than, than, than others, you know. But my, my focus, though, Vicki, is not, it, it makes me, I already told you I feel like my time is limited. And so I feel an urgency. You're not going to die a second before the Lord allows. No, you're exactly right. And I, and I feel great. <laughs> you know what I mean? I feel great about it. And God's given me my dream. Skypoint has always been my dream, having a group of people like this. That's my, my dream, so I'm the happiest guy on the planet. But my, my desire is in serving other people. So if I sit back and I talk about me, I'm not talking about them. And that's just not what I feel like my role is as a shepherd. You know, if you, if you want to be a shepherd, or if you want you know, to talk about yourself, then don't be a shepherd, in my opinion. You know what I mean? Because a shepherd gives his life for the sheep. That's the, 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 you know, and pours his life into other people. Don't focus on you. you know? Oh, it's my else to ask a question. Sorry. Getting back to it, I don't want to, you know, stay on the subject anymore. But if we're counseling somebody, we're trying to help them because they came to us and said, now I don't believe, I'm not a believer. Right. And so we go on and we try to help them with their problem. And obviously, somewhere, when they're comfortable and they look, you know, they feel good about being with us, mm -hmm. we're going to open the Bible. What if they turn around and say, don't open that thing and read one thing out of it. I don't believe in it, and I don't even want to hear anything you have to say. If they're that aggressive? Yeah, that aggressive. Okay, uh, turn to First Thessalonians chapter 5. people are, are not are not that aggressive but if they are then I'll I'll tell you how I would respond and by the way she just asked me a question about how how to respond to somebody um, all of you should have been thinking first Thessalonians 5 2 or also <laughs> You should have been thinking that. The, I want you to, to think in scripture references, okay? Uh, <clears throat> when someone brings up a topic, like if somebody wants to, to talk about materialism, I want you to know where should we go if someone wants to talk about materialism. If somebody wants to talk about money, um, there are hundreds of passages in scripture about money, and they're very insightful. They, they teach us much. I want you to start thinking that way. 
So she asked me the question, what if somebody says, don't open the Bible, I don't want to talk about the Bible, I don't want to get into that junk, I don't believe in it, it's a book of fables, right? And people, some, sometimes people have that opinion. They're probably not going to come to talk to you if that's their opinion, but if they do, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn, number one, those who are unruly. Number two, comfort the faint-hearted. Number three, uphold the weak. And lastly, be patient with all. This verse serves uh, as a funnel. The funnel counselees into different categories based upon their own attitude and approach to counseling. So if you've got someone, well, let me ask you, let me put it in the form of a question. Which category would this person fall into? Warned. Say again? Being warned. Yep. Because they're idle and disruptive. Right, because they're, they're unruly, or your Bible may use a different word, but it's something close to that. They're they're disrupting things. They're confrontational. Right? So, with that type of in individual, you respond strongly. Now, let me give you the other two before I tell you what I would say to this person. The second one, comfort the faint-hearted. Uh, the faint-hearted is the, uh, the person who has been, been hurt, wounded, damaged. That's why they need comfort. So you don't need it. Some, somebody who's been broken and busted up, you don't need to get out your spiritual hammer and hit them over the head with it. They, they need to be uplifted. They need to be comforted, right? Then the last one is to uphold the weak. Uh, the weak is someone who is in danger or some kind of external or intrinsic or internal threat, and that person's ability to resist the evil or resist the threat is diminished and they need you to step in and raise your spiritual shield and protect them. So that's the three categories of people. So this first category, if someone says, I don't believe in the Bible, let's don't use the Bible, uh, I, I don't believe in it, I don't believe in God, then um, you, you need to revert immediately to what I taught you in apologetics. Remember when we talked apologetics? Hmm. Y'all don't remember this stuff? <laughs> Um, if I, I use uh, questions and logic to argue against uh, an aggressive non-believer. Okay, now if they're not aggressive, then I would just be, my, my normal style is I'm, I'm professional, uh, I'm a wordsmith, so the words that I use are intentional, and uh, I'm confident. And I try to set them at ease. That's normally my approach. I'm normally not aggressive. If I get aggressive, something's wrong. Something's going weird. Okay. This type of individual, if they are aggressive and you know antagonistic against the gospel or antagonistic against God, then logic and questions need to be the two tools that you pull out of your spiritual tool bag. Okay. The first one is they're going to ask all kinds of questions. When they ask you a question, it puts you on the defensive. Who was Cain's wife? Cain didn't have a wife. Where'd she come from? There was an entire creation by the time she was here. You know, I, and they, they can immediately go through this thing. They can, if anybody's got a King James Bible, they can flip to a chapter in the King James Bible, and they'll ask you, who killed Goliath? Who was it? And you say, David. And they say, hmm. Well, right here it says, Elkanah slew Goliath. Your Bible is, is filled with laws in it. Right? In other words, people that are antagonistic can go and, and flip and do that, that, that type of thing. So rather than them questioning, you have to question. Okay? And the questioning needs to start with, with, with a, a logical premise that they will accept. Uh, who do you think is in charge of this world? Who do you think is in charge? I am. So you're in charge? You make all the calls? Well, I mean, my boss. So you, you, your boss is in charge? Well, no, I mean the government, the military, you know, they're they're in charge. So I, I would I would ask them questions that gets into who he believes their ultimate authority is. Remember me talking about ultimate authority? Remember this? So you, you, you've got to get them to the question of ultimate authority and say, who is that? 
So I mean, I'm just asking now. I mean, we'll, we'll go whichever route you say. Who, who is it? And I have them answer that question and ultimately get to who their ultimate authority is. Who's in charge, right? And then what I would do is I would systematically dismantle that. I, I would cause their mind to work against themselves to where they, they either want to go crazy or, or give in to the, the truth that you can't escape the reality of God. You can try, but you'll go mad doing it. So most people don't really disbelieve it, by the way. But if they say they do, most don't. But if, if this person does, I would use the go to buy a gallon of milk analogy. Remember the, about the gallon of milk? Oh, such a shallow teacher. Good grief, Scott. Um, you get out, and, and let's say you don't believe in God, or you don't believe in higher power, you don't believe in the Bible. Well, I would say, well, you know, you've got milk there in your refrigerator. How'd you get it? Well, I went to the store. Well, break that down for me. How'd, how'd, how'd that happen? Well, I just went there and bought it. Now, I get it, but I mean, explain it to me step by step. How'd you do it? Well, I went out to my car. I started my car. I drove to the end of the driveway, I turned left, stopped at the stop sign, went on through, oh, wait, 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 you stopped at the stop sign? Yes. Why'd you do that? Well, because it's the law. Oh. Well, right. well, you know, I, if, if you're your own higher authority, or there is no higher authority, then I, you know, I don't know why you did that, but go on. What, what else did you do? Well, then, I, you know, when I got to the parking lot, I pulled into a parking spot, you know. Did you park in a parking space? Yeah. Well, why'd you do that? Well, because you got to, you know, there's got to be some order to how you park in the parking lot, or cars would just be empty. Oh, so your 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 statement on how you're buying milk seems to imply an authority and an order. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, go ahead. What what happened then? Well, I went inside and I got a gallon of milk. Well, where'd where'd you find it? Well, I, I found it in the dairy section. Well, how'd you know to go there? Because I've bought milk a hundred times. I know where milk is. Well, how do you know it would still be there? Well, because there's order to the store. Okay, then what you do? Well, I, I took it to the, the cash register and I, you know, uh, paid the attendant and I left. Well, why'd you pay him? Why didn't you just walk out? Well, because, you know, I'd get arrested. <laughs> it's against the law. Like it is running a stop sign. And see, then I, I, would, I would use their own story of a, of a typical everyday thing to say your, your, your life and just this little journey that you're taking to buy a gallon of milk seems to imply a higher authority and an order. Would you agree? And they have to say yes, you know, or else they wouldn't stop. They wouldn't know where to go when they got to the store. You know, I mean, it, it would be chaos and um, universal autonomy. There would be no organizational system. There'd be no order. There'd be no authority. So they'd have to admit yes. So then I would ask, well, where do, where do you think that authority comes from? Well, it comes from the state. You know, the state sets the laws and the federal government. Okay, where, where do you think they, they got that from? Well, I don't know. I guess every society makes it up themselves. Like, well, where do you, where do you think it came from? Do you think they just created, they came up with this idea? Well, you have to have some kind of order. You have to have some kind of system of laws. I'm like, yeah, well, let me, you know, make a brief suggestion. They're, 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 you're right. You do have to have some kind of sense of order and sense of laws. Let me show you where that came from. And I would go to Exodus chapter 20 and say, these are where laws come from. Well, I, you know, I, I, I just, I don't believe that. Well, you can choose to not believe that, but God is our ultimate authority. Not you, and not the government, and not the state, and not the military. It's God. And let me tell you how you, you can know this for certain, sir. Because, you know, and then I would go, after you do the, the gallon of milk, I would immediately go beach ball. Remember me telling you about beach ball? Thank you. Praise God. So I would go to the beach, I would go to the beach ball scene and say, now, 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 imagine this. If you still want to refute it, even in the face of logic, okay, you still want to refute it. You know, if you say you're your own authority, so... If, I'm, if you're your own authority, that means I'm my own authority? Yeah. Well, in, in my authority, what if I want to take your stuff? Is that okay? I'm my own authority. I answer to me. Like, well, no, that won't work. <laughs> right? So in, individuals can't be their own authority. There's got to be something above the individual, right? Well, it, you know, it, 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 
it falls apart when you go through each one of these things as long as you drive the conversation. Then I go to the beach and I say, well, it, it, it's, if you want to, to uh, argue logic against itself, that's fine. But let's say that you're at the beach and you've got this big beach ball. And this beach ball, you know, you, 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 it's fun to kind of float on this and the waves and, 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 and try to hold that beach ball down. But the, the, the best you try, this beach ball is so big and, and inflated fully, you can't hold that underneath the water. That's the same thing that Paul is addressing in the first chapter of Romans in the Bible. He talks about how people try to suppress the truth. And sir, you're trying to hold it down. You're trying to suppress the truth, something that's innately in you. You're fighting against yourself. You were created in the image of God. God's thumbprint is on your life. And because his thumbprint's on you, he, 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 it's in you. He's in you. There's a God-sized hole in you. And you can't refute him. He's everywhere you look. Romans chapter 1 says you just look around and, and his invisible attributes are clearly seen in his creation. So when, when you try to suppress the truth, that, that what ends up happening is your mind, after a period of time, becomes hardened. Your heart becomes hardened. And if you continue doing that, if you continue fighting against yourself, fighting against logic that you'll reach a certain point in time where the Bible says, I don't know when this is, sir, and I'm not just trying to be melodramatic, I'm just telling you what the Bible says, that God will give you up. They'll say, fine. You want to reject me? And you want to reject truth? Fine. And when he does, the, the Bible says, you'll have a debased mind, which means a mind that, 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 that's, that's stripped of anything good. I don't want that to happen. I think there's something inside of you that knows that God is real. That knows there is an order out there. That knows there must be some authority out there. I think there's something inside of you that knows you're trying to suppress this and hold this down. And desperate as you are to fight against it, it's still there. So, I mean, that would be my approach to this. And then, he could say, I still think you're full of it, Scott. Like, you hit your head. And I, I would say, oh, okay, well, you, you know, what brought you in here? Why'd you come to see me? Well, I'm having marriage problems, and I heard you help with marriages. All right, let's talk about your marriage. And I would immediately go into his marriage, and I would immediately use biblical principles. Because <laughs> they work. <laughs> they work, you know. And then I would, through that process, I would pray that the Holy Spirit would move on him. I can't convince him. I can't compel him. Now, I think you should be equipped to defend your faith. You better be equipped to do that. I think it's your responsibility and privilege. But ultimately, redeeming that soul, converting that heart, changing the heart of stone to a heart of flesh, that's, that's a God work, right? We can't do it. Okay, any other questions? All right, you understand conflict resolution now? We got that down? <laughs> Can you go back to the biological and psychological? What about them? I know you described biological. I don't know if you completely described them. Psychological. Psychological is, is habit patterns. There are, um, okay, let me break this down for you. I'll show you something. This is what your head looks like. Um, now these things, there are, are billions of these neurons in your head. These neurons are ultimately who you are. Everyone says you are what you eat, you're not what you eat. But you are what you think about most of the time. So the, these are the highways uh, uh, upon which thoughts travel. And let me give you a real well, quick for instance. It's like if you were to see Eli stumbling toward the road, and your first thought is, ah, there's a baby, and let's say, does he walk? Oh, you mean Levi? Levi, I'm sorry. Yeah. Does he walk? Yeah. Okay, so let's say Levi is, is stumbling toward the road. You would immediately have this, this highly energized thoughts. It would say, ah, stop, and you would go, right, to try to get to the baby 
to not let him stumble into the road. Well, that's, that's a very uh, a base thought, a very naturalistic thought, but it's traveling down a, a system of neurons that's called a dendrite. And that dendrite is a network of uh, these cells that talk to each other. Okay, is the most simple way I know to put it. That thoughts travel down these things. So what you're asking about, Michelle, is these thoughts that are moving rapidly down this happen psychologically with someone who's an addict because they're in that process of doing it. They know if they start to get nervous, they reach for the drug, whatever it is. If they start to get apprehensive, they reach for the drug. If they're having a bad day, they reach for it. If they're having a good day, they reach for it. So it gets ingrained in their habit pattern. So not only is their, their, their cellular network crying out for it because it's had it for so long, but psychologically, they're saying, well, I, I need that. What do you mean you need it? What, you know, have you ever talked to, to an alcoholic? They need it. You know what I mean? It's not like, oh yeah, I kind of like a drink every now and then. If they're honest, they'll tell you, I, I, I need it. Psychologically speaking, they, this has happened so many times in their, their external stimulus that happens in their life. So it may be some kind of trigger. It could be it could be an individual, it could be a person, it could be a place that they go to, it could be a song, um, it could be just about anything that could trigger an impulse that says, oh, drink, drink, you know, that triggers that. Um, you've heard of muscle memory? you heard of muscle memory? It's like, um, you know, and, and the best, I don't, I don't mean to talk about my, my kids or my family, but um, I, these are the best examples I know, okay, so I, I limit them. But, you know, Anna, when, when Anna's fighting, they, she has to be trained. They, they, they'll have this, um, we'll stand up for a second. Okay, go on. A little bit. <laughs> Hold your hands up. Turn sideways. Okay. Are you right-handed? No. You're left-handed? No. That's your right hand. Okay. I'm right-handed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, she's taught, like, um, now, if you, if you will... Um, reach out with that and hit my shoulder right here. No, hit it. Okay, so it, she's taught if you get hit or if you sense something right here, it immediately triggers hook. Bam. Because that person has, has, has brought about a, an opening in their, their body that immediately triggers them. So it doesn't even think. It's like this. Bam, bam. It, it over and over and over and over again. It's that muscle memory. It's just like bam, bam, bam. You know what I mean? It, it automatically triggers it. When they see, you know, when someone sees, uh, their, if she sees their eyes move down, eyes, eyes moving down indicated a, 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 some type of forward action, probably with their power side, so probably a right, some kind of a right kick or a right punch. So when she sees their eyes move down, her hands move here. They can be out here when they're further out, but it, it just triggers an impulse, right? It's right here. Your shield comes up when that, when when somebody comes in within firing range. Well, this person, when Whenever they sense that one of these triggers, okay, like it may be, it could be song, it could be, you know, how many of y'all have ever smoked cigarettes? Um, what do you want to do in the morning? Drink coffee and cigarette. And smoke a cigarette, right? What do, you, what do you want to do as soon as lunch is over? Smoke a cigarette. You want a cigarette, right? Because cigarette's good after you, after you eat, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, be honest, right? Yes. That, that's a stimulus. See what I mean? So a psychological dependence on alcohol or whatever drug is stimulated by this thing called this this uh, this thought pattern. Okay, let me. I did the the. the um, let's turn that off so I can talk to you about something. Okay, Proverbs chapter twelve and verse twenty it says, "Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but counselors of peace." have joy. So one, one of your roles will be to bring peace into these situations where conflict is present, okay? Where the turmoil is present. In order for you to bring peace into the situation, there's two things that you have to address, okay? Number one, you have to look at, um, at all the external situations. So you have to look at what's going on, it, what's the language that's being used, what's the nature of the conflict between the two individuals, because the, the, the conflict will either be between one person and, and, and somebody else, or one group and another group, 
Or the conflict can be with just one person and can be just an internal conflict. Okay? So the first thing you want to address, and you want to understand and ask questions. When you're doing your fact finding, when you're doing uh, all of your uh, uh, understanding the nature of the problem, what you will do here is you'll seek to do everything that you can to determine what are the facts, what's actually occurred with the conflict with the two people. Was it verbal? Was it something in writing? Was it just an attitude or an expression? What's the nature of the conflict? And it may be between a husband and wife. It could be you know, just an argument that's been going on for years. Or it could be between neighbors, people that go to church together, uh, youth, uh, two teenagers. I mean, all these different, the, the nature of, of conflict. So the first thing you do is you understand what's actually occurred, uh, what, what's the behavior been. The second thing that you'll do, this is the more, the, the more difficult one, is you'll understand the internal dynamics of the problem. In other words, what inside of the two parties involved, if there are two, what inside of them sparked that? Where did it come from? What's the source? Now, do not ask the counselee this, because then you would be asking them to diagnose themselves, and, and we do not want you doing that. We want you to be the one as you're prompted by the Holy Spirit to be able to determine what's going on with this individual. Oh, we're missing Vicki. Is, uh, let's, let's pause. I don't want to leave her. Let's pause for a second. Okay, so the, the internal nature of the conflict that involves what's going on in that person, what happened, and what, what prompted this, okay? So when you read verse 20 of Proverbs 12, it says, Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil. So it goes really to the heart of the individual, and then it's the counselor's role to have uh, the, this person who creates an atmosphere where peace can be present. Okay, that's, that's what we want. If you think about the fruit of the Spirit, uh, uh, peace is part of that, 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 that type of, of calmness in a person's life. That should be present. If you've got, if you know somebody, or if you're the somebody, okay, just be honest for a second. If you're the somebody where uh, all the relationships you're involved in, there seems to be conflict, and you're the common denominator, that's a very bad thing. Okay, um, I'm not being ugly. I'm just saying if you're a type of person that's involved in conflict, that's not a godly characteristic. You need to be the person that's the peacemaker. Now. Your goal, now listen to this, this is important when you're talking about conflict. Your goal is not peace. Your goal is intimacy with Christ. Okay, so that has to be the aim, that has to be where we're headed. But what you should notice, the fruit of intimacy should be peace. The fruit of closeness to Christ should be peace surrounding us. Okay, now let me... Um, Move on from there. Go to Matthew chapter 5. You all know anybody like this? Conflict people? Let me give you a great verse. This, this has been um, one of my verses. There are some verses that I own. I just take them. Um, this is one of those that I have owned for a long time, and I'll, I'll let you borrow it for a while. Okay? This is Matthew chapter 5. Look at verse 9. Beautiful, beautiful passage. It says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So think about your role as a counselor. You have the opportunity to be a child of the king through your behavior, to be called this high rank um, in the kingdom. Just a, just a beautiful thing. All right, flip to your right to Romans chapter 14. When you get there, find verse 19 in Romans 14. Verse 19 says, Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which may edify one another. 
So we're supposed to pursue these things, to hunt out these things. So it'll be your responsibility as a counselor when you have two warring parties, two opposing parties, and you'll have this a lot. Conflict is part of counseling. Okay? When you see that, you will have to be able to determine what is the initial area of commonality. Okay, so let me give you a couple things quickly. I have so much to say to you. I want to take everything and just pour it into you guys. So you'll look for initial commonality. Now there is you're looking for what kind of area between two warring parties, whatever it is, if it's conflict between a husband and wife, a, a child, a, a parent, neighbors, co-workers, family members, whatever, this works. Okay. So you would look for some kind of initial commonality. Where can we find some kind of win? Now, the conference table, if you're, uh, all of you have been through SelfCon, so you should know the, the conference table. The conference table uses this psychology behind the scenes. The, the conference table tells you before you have a difficult conversation, we're going to agree to adhere to the principles in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to do these principles, right? We're going to adhere. We're going to speak the truth in love. Um, we're going to act and not react. We're going to attack problems and not people, right? So you agree that you're going to adhere to those things before you ever start. So what we're doing, we want to find our commonality. If you've got two people that are believers, then which is well, you, you'll have probably most of the time, then you want the commonality to be upon what we're going to determine what the Word of God says, and from that, we're going to base our behavior on what the Word says. And so if I'm not in alignment with it, I'm agreeing. My area of commonality is I'm going to agree to bring my behavior, my speech, my thoughts, my attitudes, I'm going to bring them into alignment with what Scripture says. Will you agree to do that too? And then the opposing party does the same. Okay, That will initially start with Scripture. This is where you begin. This is how you, you resolve a difficult situation between two, two people. So this is number one. Number two, after you do that with Scripture, you will do that with some type of behavior that's based upon a value system. In other words, you will take something that's significant and important to them, and you will try to determine something that both of them share, some type of shared value system. You know, you'll do this a lot with if you have a warring ex-wife and ex-husband. They are just doing absolute battle. They've got the divorce, but there's still all kinds of conflict going on in their life, and he said, she said, all kinds of, of issues. But if they have a child... Instead of that child becoming a trophy, which is what happens many times in a divorce, that one pulls it this way, the other one pulls the child that way, right? So instead of them being a trophy, you could have an area of value system commonality in the area of the child. You could say this child, now you love your son, I know you do. Yes, I do, I give my life to my son. And you would say to the other, the ex-wife, you love your son, right? I know, you, you love him. Well, of course I love him. Why would you even say that? I gave birth to him. I, of course I, you know what I mean? So both of them have this area of value system commonality. So now what we've done is we've established scriptural adherence commonality, right? They're going to adhere to what the Bible says. They're going to align themselves with the Bible. And now we've, we, we've, we've developed a value system commonality. Those two things have to be in place. And now the third thing is you'll do areas of this agreement but this is not with individuals but it's with scripture here's what I mean you the areas of disagreement when you get to this part of conflict resolution you're not saying well you think it should be this and you think it should be this that's not what you're going that's what they will do they will say, I told him Johnny should have spent the summer with me. Right? That's what they'll say. And he'll say, well, you know, last time I sent her to be with him, you know, she was out in the bars and running out with other men, and, you know, he's only 12. You know, he doesn't understand all that. It's not a good environment. I mean, surely, Scott, you can see as a counselor, this isn't a good environment for Johnny. 
right? So they're both postured up in what they want to happen with Johnny, for instance. Okay, I'm just giving you a, an example, right? So what, instead of me fighting on their ground, you're going to reframe the boundaries of the conversation. See what I'm saying? Am I explaining this right? Or are you getting it? Yeah. I, you're going to reframe the boundaries. You're going to set the tone for the conversation. You're not going to tell them that. You're just going to do it. Okay? So I'm going to look for, not for areas of individual dispute, but for areas of scriptural variance. I want to see where they're, where they're, uh, where they're violating scripture. So this way, for me, I'm not choosing up sides. Whenever you're in the counseling setting, how many of y'all have counseled? Raise your palm. Okay, so uh, all of y'all really have counseled somebody. So in a counseling, have, have you ever been pulled toward a side or toward a view? I mean, it happens all the time. You know, if you have two people come in, one person says, well, Scott, let me tell you what happened. I'll tell you. You know, she's an unreasonable, hard-hearted, mean, vicious, cruel, low-down, dirty person. I mean, she's mean. You know, and then you hear her talk. She's like, well, let me tell you about him, you know. Billy Bob is the worst, you know, and, and, you know. So they all, they'll try to pull you toward a side. You don't ever take sides. You're on God's side. That's where you are, right? So when, when, when you're in the middle of the conflict, rather than getting involved in their uh, dispute that they've set, you completely reframe the boundaries of the conversation, and you discuss what, what with them is a violation of Scripture. So I'll go to, to, to what was her name? Flo, let's just call it Flo. You didn't call her anything. You didn't really call her. We'll go to Flo, and I would I would look for whatever kind of scriptural variances or violations are happening with Flo's argument. Okay, because she's already agreed with me that she will adhere to scripture. She ain't gonna listen to Billy Bob because he's nuts, but she will listen to the Bible. Okay, so my my point is I'm not gonna argue on Billy Bob's half for half to Flo. I'm going to argue with Flo. On scriptures, man. Then I'm going to go to Billy Bob, and my, my same position with Billy Bob. He's going to say, "Well, you're just taking her side." No, I'm not. I'm not on her side. I'm on God's side, and you should be too. Right? You don't want to put yourself in opposition to him. So both of the arguments reframe to their biblical adherence, not to their positions that they came before. Make sense? Yeah, but both people need to be validated. So how are you going to do that? You're just going to keep pulling them towards the scripture, so that, that call, give, give some peace. Well, um, I don't know that, that they may think they need to be validated, but I don't think that's the, the case. I, you know, um, I would go back to their, their value commonality. I would go back to their value system right here and say, I know you love Johnny. I know you love him. Do you really want what's best for him? Yes. Okay, do, you, do you believe you know God's word is best for Johnny, is best for guidance? For how, how do you raise a 12-year-old boy that's been split between two warring factions of mom and dad? The people he used to look to and trust now hate each other and, 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 and cut each other to shreds with their, with their tongues. Don't you think we should go to the scriptures and find out what the Lord would have us to do? You know what I mean? I, I would still go back to the value system. The value system commonality sets the tone for, okay, I'm, I'm going to do it. Now this brings them, what you've done now is you've brought them along from being very postured up, very much entrenched in their positions, very emotionalized, very angry. you brought them to a place of, all right, I, I, I ain't going to do what she says, but I will line myself up with, with Scripture and do what's best for Johnny. I will do that. So you, you've, you've reframed the entire conversation. Does that make sense? Do you reframe it from the perspective of Okay, we're not going to pick apart what you're doing wrong, but we're going to present it as here's what Jesus would do. And or do you go, okay, you're you're doing this wrong, and here's the scripture that says, okay, you shouldn't do it this way. Because mm -hmm. I'm thinking if if I got two opposing parties, I don't want to pick on one first because that would make the other one right. feel like they're being. He said, validated. He said, all right, he's got some eyesight because he, he's picking on her first. See, I knew I was right. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a good question. And I'm not sure if there's a, if there's a hard, fast answer to that. Then. So I think you would have to feel out that situation. I prefer 
rather than saying you did this wrong and this wrong and this wrong, you know, if it's the unruly person that needs to be warned, that's the word warned is the word nutheteo, they need to be nuthetically confronted with the truth. But if it's if they're not that person, then I would rather say this is the optimum lifestyle for Johnny. This is what scripture says, that you're to raise him in nurture and admonition. Seems to me like you guys are strong on admonition, but I'd like to see, let's balance out nurture. So I would try to, to, to direct them into this is what scriptures say, you know, and I would do that for both of them. I think that's preferable to saying, well, you did this wrong, and you did this wrong, and you did this wrong. Most of the time, if someone is under conviction, you don't have to tell them. They'll kind of know. Now, if they're rebellious, or you know, if their attitude is more confrontational, then you know you may need to confront the sin directly. But I think those things need need to be balanced. I would focus on not as John, not as Billy Bob right or Flo right. I would focus on what's what the scripture says is best for John. Other questions, comments? Okay, I've gone way over time and talk way too much about personal stuff. I shall not do that again. Thank you all very much for your attendance and uh, for loving the Lord. Thank you for caring. And uh, I, I meant what I said earlier. You guys are the spiritual warriors. The fighting that you're doing is, is vital. Most people are not standing up for the Lord and for the truth like you are. Most pastors are not doing what you're doing. You being willing to open your heart and open the Bible and having the guts and the courage to set eyeball to eyeball with somebody else who is facing life altering life threatening type situations is amazing. So I applaud you. I'm proud of you and, and very thankful for your love for the Lord. Somebody want to close this out? Let me turn this off.